management and patients with uh, vestibular schwannomas. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so um, the learning objectives for this talk is to go over options and hearing uh, and uh, outcomes and hearing preservations for, for patients with unilateral and bilateral vestibular schwannomas in whom hearing preservation is uh, feasible. So uh, that and then briefly we'll just touch on hearing re rehabilitation options available uh, to when hearing preservation is not an option or is unsuccessful. So um, though there has been, as we all know, an evolution in the management of uh, vestibular schwannomas. Um, uh, staples taken from uh, Jackler's textbook in neurotology and uh, it's, it's uh, very small on the screen, but in uh, approximately 1913, the mortality rate from vestibular schwannoma surgery was uh, was 84 uh, percent, and uh, more recently in 2003, it, it dropped to uh, uh, less than 0.5 percent. So, a lot of that's probably due to technique. Um, this uh, 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 drawing was taken from Krauss's textbook on neurosurgery, uh, which was published um, in uh, 1912. Um, so, our first goal was to um, uh, survival and uh, survival improved uh, was cut in half by uh, uh, the mid uh, turn uh, uh, 20th uh, 20th century to 43 percent and then the next goal was uh, preservation of facial nerve function which improved with uh, various techniques uh, but now it's more our focus is on hearing and so we know these uh, tumors can be unilateral or bilateral they tend to be slow growing uh, the average growth rate is um, uh, one to two mil, uh, millimeters a year. They can grow continuously. They can get to a certain size and then stop growing. And uh, some can actually shrink. Um, <clears throat> so they come in all shapes and sizes from this uh, tiny little uh, vestibular schwannoma we see here on the, on the right to very large uh, tumors. Uh, can reach uh, several centimeters in size and cause uh, multiple uh, uh, symptoms and side effects. Uh, generally, the presenting symptom is uh, hearing loss or tinnitus, uh, and then later uh, vertigo or imbalance, uh, sometimes earfulness, rarely uh, facial nerve uh, dysfunction. Um, we know from our colleagues in Denmark where they uh, maintain a uh, vestibular schwannoma database um, since 1976, the population is 5.4 million, uh, that uh, the incidence of these uh, tumors seems to be increasing. They, uh, they, they recently quoted the incidence to be about one per uh, 50,000 uh, diagnosed with MRI. And we know from them that the size of these tumors at uh, the time of diagnosis is uh, decreasing. In uh, 1976, uh, the average size of diagnosis is approximately three centimeters. And then more recently, it's uh, probably around uh, uh, one, one centimeter. And a third of those are all intramedial tumors. So it begs the question, what do, we, what do we do with these little tumors? Do we wait, watch, and rescan, continue to observe, uh, treat them with radiation or, or uh, surgery? So in general, most of the small tumors, most, most times patient preference is to go for observation and they get their first audiogram and MRI at six months. And then uh, if the tumor has not changed in size, we go for a yearly MRI and audiogram and then if the tumor enlarges, we initiate some type of treatment because that's the only predictor we have of future growth. Uh, it's not the age, the sex of the patient. Uh, there's nothing that's been shown to be a predictor of growth other than uh, a history of growth. So <clears throat> when patients have tumors like this, this five centimeter tumor, uh, the uh, tumor that Dr. Campero is uh, removing today, the, the, the option is really, it's, it's clear. And we, we know what to do, it's surgery. It makes it easy on us. Uh, but when they're small tumors or small to medium size and the patients have good hearing, that's when the, there's controversy as far as what do we do with the tumors. And they, there's differences of opinion that exist you know, among radiation oncologists and surgeons, uh, neurosurgeons, and even in between neurotologists and neurosurgeons, how do we manage these tumors? And then furthermore, the data are confusing due to uh, variability of follow-up in the reports um, in terms of uh, radiation, the uh, uh, radiation is frequently changing in terms of different protocols. Um, and uh, there's a lack of uniformity in the definition of uh, hearing preservation. <clears throat> and in addition, there's different scales that we measure hearing preservation with. There, there's the 
uh, the, the Gardner Robinson, the AOHNS scale, and then there's a word recognition scale uh, from University of Iowa. Uh, but the most commonly used are uh, numbers one and two, the AO and Gardner Robinson scale, uh, where we uh, where they have uh, a comparable um, uh, measure of serviceable hearing, uh, where the uh, pure tone uh, audiometry is less than 50 dB, and speech discrimination score is uh, greater than 50 percent. Uh, and types A and B for the AAO scale, and types one and two uh, for Gardner Robinson. So, if we look at some of the results from observation, uh, radiation, and uh, surgery, it, it helps shed a little bit of light on how we manage these small tumors. So, SMU on 2005 <coughs> uh, presented a uh, meta analysis where we looked at uh, 21 studies, uh, included about 1,000 or 1,300 patients. The average follow up was uh, 3.2 years, and and the hearing status could be determined in approximately 347 of those patients. And uh, in these patients that were observed, 51% of them uh, lost lost some hearing. Um, the standard up, the Denmark group, same group that pre presented us the epidemiology uh, study, had uh, 33 years of follow-up on 100, uh, 1,144 patients. Uh, and in all these patients, they had annual MR. And audiologic examinations, and um, of the patients with 100% speech discrimination at diagnosis, they uh, approximately 70% of them maintain good hearing at 10 years. Um, in terms of radiation, uh, a recent systematic review uh, presented by Yang in uh, 2010, they looked at 45 publications, included about 4,200 patients. And overall hearing preservation was 50% at uh, three to four years. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Mayo group, uh, their results, uh, they looked specifically at serviceable hearing and uh, I think it was 44 patients over a 10 year period of time after radiation, one quarter of the patient's side uh, still had serviceable hearing, so uh, not as good. And others have shown the same thing as far as uh, radiation goes. Uh, in their own series where they specifically looked at serviceable hearing and radiation over a period of 10 years, you can see that the, um, the even at the, uh, at the uh, Pittsburgh group, uh, the, their serviceable hearing rate was approximately 44% at, uh, at 10 years. Um, in Australia, there's an Australian group that uses um, linac based linear accelerator accelerator uh, stereotactic radiotherapy and the hearing preservation rate was 23 percent at 10 years similar to the male group and the denmark group um it's the same group they presented their uh, results from fractionated uh, stereotactic radiotherapy at 10 years and it was uh, zero um, so this is recently published in Lingoscope. Uh, Denmark group also in their paper compared, uh, did a comparison of the fractionated stereotactic radio uh, therapy patients in a control group where the patients were just watched and uh, their tumors didn't grow and the uh, control group fared uh, significantly better at, at two years. Um, so the factors that can affect uh, hearing preservation in uh, patients that get radiation are the tumor size, patient age, uh, the tumor marginal dose, dose to the cochlear nucleus, uh, pretreatment hearing status, and dose to the cochlea. In terms of surgery, uh, there's a paper by Harsha and Backhaus where they looked at uh, both retrosigmoid and middle FOSS results, which we reviewed at, uh, over a thousand articles for the period of 1994 to uh, 2004, and they included 30, 31 papers met their inclusion criteria, and uh, hearing was preserved in approximately 30% of patients when they separated out metal fossa versus retrosigmoid. Uh, the, the patients fared better with the metal fossa approach. But patients, as we all know, with retrosigmoid approach generally have surgery for hearing preservation on larger tumors, so that weighs in there. Uh, two of their studies that weren't included in that review are a little more recent, were from Iowa and uh, University of Michigan, uh, where the hearing preservation rates after surgery were 57% and 73%, uh, 57% uh, for Iowa, and 73% uh, for uh, University of Michigan. The uh, long-term results uh, from these centers is good, are, are good, 81% uh, in five years from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, that's uh, serviceable hearing holding up over that time period. And then at uh, University of Iowa is very similar, and in fact, a little bit better, at 88% at five years. Uh, patients were able to maintain uh, good word understanding. So. Um, 
Factors that we need to consider when uh, picking uh, patients for hearing preservation surgery include the, uh, are, there are multiple things to take into consideration, and it actually gets fairly confusing for everyone. But in general, you know, you could attempt to preserve hearing with any size tumor, but in general, it's reasonable to consider tumors uh, two centimeters or less uh, when they have hearing that's worth preserving. Uh, so that's uh, uh, PTA greater than 50% or SDS score of uh, um, uh, um, it, that's actually that's the operate PTA should, that's the opposite PTA less than 50, 50 dB or a speech discrimination score should be greater than uh, 50 percent. Um, there's ele different electro electrophysiologic studies that we can use uh, to kind of help us try and predict what the probability of uh, preserving hearing with surgery. So if they have a, a good or a normal ABR that uh, has a positive predictive uh, factor on uh, hearing preservation. A, a good preoperative word recognition score. Uh, VEMP, which is a, a, a physiologic test, it's otherwise known as a, a, a vestibular revoked myogenic potentials. It's a test of uh, where we can actually, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a measurement of a relaxation potential of the sternocleidomastoid muscle in response to uh, sound in the ear, and it's a measure of the function of the inferior vestibular nerve. So a normal VEMP indicates that the uh, tumor is on the superior vestibular nerve, which correlates with uh, a better prognosis in terms of hearing preservation surgery. Same goes for a, a VNG. So if a VNG is abnormal, which is the opposite of, of VEMP, that as it indicates that uh, the tumor is on the superior vestibular nerve. But I think the things that are really the most important to consider in these surgical uh, patients are what's the patient's preference, number one, and then really just the anatomy. As surgeons, we, uh, you know, we know when we're going to be able to preserve hearing in a patient, so the tumor location and shape, uh, and, and really uh, what's come to be a little more important as we kind of look at, at these uh, tumors is just the presence or absence of a funnel cap. So in the, in the internal auditory canal, uh, as you can see in this patient, um, on the uh, this tumor on the right, let's see if I get this thing. Um, the uh, you can see uh, the the presence of a little hint of cerebral spinal fluid in the fundus, the uh, right internal auditory canal. Um, and if you look at the cor um, the coronal view, this is a, um, a coronal reconstruction from the axial images. But you can sort of see that this uh, patient's tumor on the right side there is more positioned towards the superior aspect of the internal auditory canal. So um, this is a patient that I would uh, consider favorable uh, for surgery and was. We were able to preserve his hearing with surgery. So, um, so it's worth mentioning hearing preservation strategy and neurofibromatosis on a talk, a talk on uh, hearing management and vestibular schwannoma. Um, but just so just briefly, uh, one strategy would be to uh, remove the smaller tumor uh, um, with a goal of hearing preservation. And then uh, if you uh, fail to save hearing in the first year but are able to preserve an intact uh, cochlear nerve and the patient's gradually losing their hearing, you can consider a cochlear implant. Um, and, uh, and then if you're unable to save hearing or the cochlear nerve, those patients uh, would be candidates for auditory brainstem implants. But if you have uh, stable tumors and bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss, uh, whether it's a patient with NF2 or even a sporadic tumor, uh, and a patient with bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss, you can consider a uh, cochlear implant in those patients. Um, uh, in NF2, these are, this is being done in patients that are being observed and, and are treated with neurofibromatosis type 2. Um, sorry, treated with stereotactic radio surgery and in sporadic tumors. Um, I have uh, three patients that I've uh, gone ahead and done this for. Uh, two in, um, in the case of stereotactic radio surgery and stable tumors for a number of years, and one in the case of a patient with a bilateral severe to pro profound hearing loss and a unilateral uh, sporadic uh, small vestibular schwannoma that just wasn't growing for a number of years and he needed, uh, wanted to hear. So uh, the male uh, 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 experience with this was published in uh, 2010. They had 10 patients, uh, sorry, 2012, they had 10 patients. Um, one, uh, um, four patients under one SRS, and then um, later had a, uh, a cochlear implant. Uh, three of their patients uh, have open set speech perception. One patient has uh, no perception of sound, so that's uh, something to take into consideration. One was observed and has open set speech, speech perception. Um, uh, my patients of the three, one we just did last week, 
um, and uh, one was NF2, uh, that, that patient had NF2 and that stereotactic radio surgery to his tumor, so we're yet to see what his results are going to be. I had another uh, that had a good response with his cochlear implant and achieved uh, speech understanding scores of 66%, but then later, over the course of two years, it, it deteriorated. Another uh, uh, option to t we should keep in mind uh, for these patients when surgery or radiation is um, not an option or um, they're kind of it, it's just not making sense for them anymore is it the uh, chemotherapy. So as we know, Scott Plotkin reported on this in 2009 and was able to imp and show improved hearing in some but not all patients. Um, and uh, it was associated with reduction in volume in most, uh, growing most of their growing vestibular schwannomas. I think they had 12 in this report. So if, when you have patients with single-sided deafness after a sporadic uh, treatment of uh, sporadic vestibular schwannoma, more often than not, these patients are um, content. They, they uh, don't want to go any further. But uh, if they are looking for an option, um, the simplest thing is a cross, what's called a cross-hearing system where they where two hearing devices and it's wireless transmission of sound uh, from one, one ear to the other. Uh, the use of a bicross is, is uh, it's similar, uh, but in that case, uh, the hearing ear has some hearing loss, uh, so there's amplification uh, there as well. Um, there's also bone conduction uh, where the, uh, there's an implant placed in the patient's skull on the deaf ear, and the sound is transmitted through the uh, skull to the opposite ear where the skull attenuation of sound, uh, the intraoral attenuation of sound is zero dB, so it's a good quality hearing for these patients. And then also single um, cochlear implants, as we had mentioned, if there's an intact cochlear nerve. <clears throat> so in conclusion, it's difficult to determine whether one vestibular uh, schwannoma treatment method is superior in terms of hearing preservation due to uh, frequently changing radiation treatment protocols, discrepancies in how hearing preservation is reported and variable follow-up, and then opinions uh, differ markedly in how, as how to best manage acoustic aroma in the presence or, of normal or neuronormal hearing, but it's uh, my opinion and the opinion of uh, others that uh, middle cranial fossa approach uh, removal when the tumor is small and the hearing is good appears to provide the best opportunity for hearing preservation and normal facial nerve function. Uh, thank you.